just want to start this by saying what a privilege it is for me to be moderating this session. Uh, these are four remarkable people. They've, they've achieved remarkable things. And I am thinking back to a program uh, that Chief Judge Cole and I were at um, last year. Uh, it was about uh, the legacy of Reconstruction. And we had presentations by historians and we had presentations by judges who had thought about the significance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And then we had some private meetings among the judges. And at one point in one of the private meetings, people started talking about their personal histories. And it was, I think in my entire judicial career, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen. Because I learned things about people that I didn't know and, and people spoke with tremendous passion about their, uh, their personal histories, both African-American and white judges and Latino judges. So it was, it was just the, the effect that uh, growing up uh, in an environment uh, where race mattered and where people's backgrounds were strongly affected by that, uh, how it affected all of us as, as people. And uh, it, was, it was really quite compelling. And, and Chief Judge Cole was one of the people who, who told his story, and I'm going to start with him, both because of that and also because we're going to go in alphabetical order, and, and he's first in, in that uh, category as well. So, Guy, let me ask you, um, you, you said, and I'm going to quote something you wrote to me, uh, part of getting me into the law is tied to Birmingham's tortured history. So tell us about that. It was really in the crucible of that time period uh, for me that as a just a, through the eyes of a child that I came to have a sense for what I you know viewed as uh, you know fairness and and justness and what's right and what's what's not right um, there were a number of, of kids of course who grew up uh, on the top of the hill and uh, many of them have gone into law medicine and other fields but there was an article back in 2005 uh, in the Birmingham News that notes, I think it's, uh, it's written by a guy, guy named John Archibald, and it says something like, justice rolls down from the hill. And it notes that at that time there were six uh, uh, people from Birmingham in my age range within a four block area who had become either federal or state judges. And I don't know if that uh, uh, is under or above the you know, sort of national average, but something tells me that's above. <laughs> um, you know, it was the area where uh, there were a number of civil rights leaders. Uh, there were uh, black businessmen and, and doctors and dentists. And, and the lawyers who were there, in many cases, were very much activists in the civil rights arena. Uh, Arthur Shores, about whom several books have been written, was, was a lawyer who lived a block from me. Uh, he was Martin Luther King's uh, Alabama lawyer, so to speak. Oscar Adams, for any of you who are from Alabama, was the first uh, black justice on the Alabama Supreme Court. And there were several other uh, lawyers on, uh, on, on the Hill, as I call it, who were just very active in civil rights uh, activities. So I guess, Jeremy, that's where I got my first start. Uh, it, it was an area that was rocked, as many articles that many of you have probably read uh, indicate, by bombings. And that's how we got the name Dynamite Hill. Arthur Shore's house was bombed, I think, seven times. And then the 16th Street church bombing that killed four young girls uh, Cynthia Wesley is one of those girls who lived next door to me. Carol Robertson was another uh, young girl. They were you know, 14 years old at, at that time. And Birmingham's come a long way, and I'm very proud of, of its progress and its evolution. Uh, I do have one of my brothers who still lives there, so I get back to see it from time to time. But I think that's part of the path, and I don't know if any of the six of us who became judges can really point to any one thing about Birmingham that sort of led us on this road toward becoming lawyers and judges. But in, in the conversations I've had with a couple of people, uh, it was just being a part of that movement at that time 
that so many people, black and white, had toward trying to bring racial justice to, to Birmingham. Uh, both parents uh, worked in a tobacco factory. Uh, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school, let alone to go to college, and then on to law school. Uh, but my parents, the pathway clearly started with them. They, they gave me broad shoulders, and, and even though I lived in a parallel universe, if you will, everything was segregated, uh, segregated schools. And I think I started uh, school back in 1959, and I was just so blessed, even within that crucible of, of segregation, because had I lived some 60 miles to the west in Prince Edward County, that was the same month they started uh, massive resistance and there were no schools there for five years for African Americans. So I was fortunate there, but I started in 59. and I remember having old books that were uh, so old, I remember it was barely enough room at the bottom for me to put my name on. And I always think about that. I said, uh, I don't know what the, where the previous owners are now, and I hope they're all doing well. But thank God uh, the little boy's name was on the bottom, was on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And uh, that's not about me, that's, but that's about many people who struggled and who believed in those days when hope unborn had died, that uh, somebody like me could believe, read the Constitution and books about the, uh, the fullness of the American dream, and one day I might be able to walk in that. Uh, but there were some difficulties. I remember in the park we had, there were uh, benches, and African Americans basically sort of, you keep going. If you went in, you didn't sit down. But finally, when, um, when, when the law says you had to, the benches were removed so that no one could sit down. And I think about that in terms of in terms of ways, thought about that, but people have a way of finding common ground. And uh, another iron in the sense that didn't have benches, but now I sit on a bench. And, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, uh, but, I, but I think about that so many people could have been uh, many things. Uh, you know, I, I take some pause when people talk about being a credit on an anomaly of, of race or of a people. Not at all. And many people much smarter than I am is just because of the, the circumstances, didn't get the opportunities, and I, I just feel so fortunate. And lastly, I think about a pathway. I went to Virginia State College, which is a historically black college in Petersburg. And my mother, when she was 16 years old, she was a dormitory maid in that school. And I think about uh, you know, the time, my mom would have been a great lawyer. I mean, she could argue her case, no question. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, and back it up too many times, <laughs> literally. But I thought about, you know, she didn't curse the darkness. Instead, she lit a candle. And I'm, I'm part of that candle. And uh, in my job, I feel that where am I am to light that candle for all people, black, white, brown, yellow, whatever it might be that uh, the fullness of justice and what constitutional democracy is can be in fruition. My parents are from Ascension Parish, uh, Donaldsonville, as you said, and uh, a rural parish without a whole lot of opportunity, so a lot of folks wound up in New Orleans. And I, I went to school there, and of course the schools were segregated. When I graduated from high school in 1960, our, schools, our public schools were still segregated. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can still recall uh, getting on a bus uh, on St. Claude Avenue and passing this school every day and our teacher had announced Brown against Board of Education when I was uh, in that, uh, well I guess middle school and I said well you know I'll get a chance to go to that school but it didn't happen because uh, in Louisiana as in everywhere else in the South, we, we desegregated the system from the ground up, meaning from first grade. I think probably Arkansas, uh, Central High School, uh, Arkansas, Arkansas may have been the only state that uh, desegregated from the high school level, from the top down. Uh, graduated from high school uh, in New Orleans and had the great opportunity to attend Spelman College in Atlanta on a scholarship. Uh, I would have gone to uh, Dillard or Xavier probably and been a school teacher if the folk from Spelman College hadn't shown up and offered me the scholarship. And so I wound up in Atlanta for college. It broadened my vision. I had a chance to meet Howard Moore and some other uh, prominent black lawyers and had a chance to work for them, uh, some of us with the Legal Defense Fund. And uh, that's what I did first, um, uh, working in school desegregation cases 
around the South and uh, Mississippi and uh, Birmingham, Montgomery, Gadsden, Alabama, and Tennessee. And, and um, my job was to sit there on the front porch and convince parents uh, that they should send their first graders to the newly desegregated schools. And everybody, everybody knew the history of violence. And, and, uh, and so I, I've got to be persuasive because I'm telling someone, no, we really, the Brown against Board of Education doesn't mean anything unless we take advantage of this uh, uh, lawsuit, this judgment, and this litigation. And so I've got to convince a parent that they need to send their child into what they know may even be a violent situation. And maybe that's where I, I started the persuasive skills. I, 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 I did that summers and uh, in a whole lot of southern states. I grew up in, in that part of the state. It was a very racist area of the state. I grew up from all, with an all black uh, high school. And it was the kind of place once I left, I really never wanted to come back there. But I grew up, when I was four years old, my dad was the lead plaintiff in a class action to uh, get a Negro subdivision for, for us there in Shreveport. And um, uh, Constance Baker Motley, who later became the first African-American federal judge, was a housing specialist with the LDF. And so she came to Shreveport and represented my dad in a class to try to get the house when we were four. Uh, we never got the house due to a variety of racial issues, including uh, the police jury and other people who passed an ordinance that they couldn't hook utilities up to the subdivision and so on and so forth and a whole lot of other machinations that I learned about earlier. But the point is, is that, you know, my dad uh, is 90 and still alive, uh, was, a, was a letter carrier. He carried the mail before they rode in the truck and the Jeep. He carried the mail up and down the hills. But he worked part time at night selling air conditioning and all that. My mother was a domestic worker. But both of our parents believed that education was a great equalizer. And so when we were young, they taught us to read, to study. They bought me a Time Magazine subscription when I was in fifth grade. It is unbroken even to now that I still take the magazine. But he taught us to read. We always had library cards. You had to read. You cut the TV off. It just was that. And so 1967, when I graduated from high school, was the first year of integration in the public schools. But it was a tumultuous time. I chose to stay in my high school. I was the battalion commander of the junior ROTC there, uh, so I had a leadership position. I graduated and went to an all-black, uh, an HBCU, Dillard University in New Orleans. Uh, and I, it was the time of the, the Vietnam War. I had a low draft number and a very mean racist draft board. And so they made it very clear that uh, they would get to me in due course. If you were white, you had other options, National Guard, and all that sort of thing, but if you were black, you just didn't. And so knowing inevitably that, you know, at some juncture I would probably, you know, get drafted, et cetera. But when I was in, in college, uh, I remember when the stats were up there about the law schools this morning, that $100,000 worth of debt. Um, so, you know, I went to a private school, but my dad always told us, don't worry about going to public against, you go where you want to go. You do your part and I'll do mine. And so he never told us we had to go to public school to say tuition. He says, well, you go where you can go, get the best education. So I went to private undergrad, private law school, had all that debt. We had plenty of loans, scholarships, work study, all those packages and all that. So I never had a premium summer job. When I was in college, I worked in Bayfield Industries making munitions, you know, these munitions uh, in a factory and other kind of menial summer job, but I worked because, you know, that's what you had to do to get out of undergrad. So when I went to law school, because of the draft number, uh, I had the specter of perhaps getting drafted out of school. I have an older brother who actually went to law school first, but he was drafted out of law school. He joined the Navy, went to OCS. He later retired as a Navy captain, 26 years in Jack. I didn't want to be drafted out of school. And so the Army had come up with a brand new program, two-year ROTC, but it was for undergrads. But because I had been battalion commander in the junior ROTC in high school, they gave me an exception to be in the ROTC at Loyola. So I went to evidence class, sitting in a green uniform with 150 people in the class, for the professor able to point me out to ask, you know, answer the questions. But I did one summer at Fort Knox, Kentucky, 
one of the worst summers of my life. Uh, and I did another summer at Fort Riley, Kansas, another worst summer of, of my life. So I didn't have an opportunity to have the kind of jobs that a lot of law, excuse me, you know, working some in the law firms, I was doing, you know, doing it. But being in the military is one of the greatest experiences that I had. Uh, so when I finished, passed the bar exam, I had heavy pressure to pass the first time because I had an entry date to go into the Army waiting on me. I passed, went to the JAG school. And sir, I served three years as a captain of JAG Corps, one of the greatest things that happened to me. Instant responsibility, representing clients, doing court martials, and I love trial work. And so that's when my love for the trial work began. Great responsibility, great discipline. I wouldn't take anything, man, I don't know. I thought I wouldn't take anything for Fort Knox and Fort Riley, but I ain't too sure I want to go for that because I had some mean drill sergeants and all that. But the military really instilled discipline, organization, responsibility, et cetera. And I really think it was a platform for a lot of the things that I've done since because being in that environment, there was no time to be scared. You got plenty of responsibility. You just kind of got to do it. And it really showed me that though be graduating from a, an all-black school with hand-me-down books, et cetera, the confidence that the teachers and others said instilled in me that you can do it, you can do it. You know, that confidence just allowed me to, you know, try anything to do that. I spent three years in Jack, you know, got out, didn't want to go home because of the past, you know, and I ended up, though, working in the Attorney General's office. I later was in AUSA, tried cases, and that was my adventure in the federal court. Loved trying cases in federal court and really peering before some wonderful federal judges. And so, say, hey, one of these days, you know, maybe I'll get a chance to be a judge and all that. But long story short, I was elected a state trial judge when I was 35 years old. I was the first black elected to that court. I spent seven years on the trial bench, the absolute best period of my professional life, trying cases with lawyers. I loved the trials. And I think those years as a trial judge helped make me be a better appellate judge. I spent three years on the appellate court uh, before coming to the federal court. And there was another person uh, for a seat on the federal court, but the senior senator uh, was from Shreveport. And you get one of these calls that say, you know, there's a seat open. Would you like to be a federal judge? Huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, really? So, you know, I never had you know, was qualified, moved through, 99 to nothing, you know, none of all these questions, no litmus test, no nothing. And so, so straight on through the deal and yeah, I am. You know, you can't focus on uh, the, the racism. Um, like I said, I was at LSU 1965 to 1968. Uh, that was the summer that, well, the spring really, that. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And so, you know, you always, they always want to know, uh, well, tell us some of your LSU stories. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to dredge up yeah. uh, all, I don't really need to feed on racism from 40 years ago or, or slights. So my, my focus when, when I talk about LSU, I'm going to tell you about somebody who was there to help me. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about uh, Margaret O'Mara, who made sure I had notes. I mean. You know, the frat boys had their poop sheets, and I had every note I needed because Margaret O'Mara made sure I did. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you focus on the positive, and you move forward, because if you keep, and, and one of my professors told me that, don't, don't be a, a martyr or a victim. You know, just, just uh, uh, do, do what you need to do and move, move forward. And you've got to have hope. And if you come from a family of faith, uh, I come from a family of Baptist preachers. Uh, my, my grandfather was superintendent of the Sunday school and we all went to church, we're church people. And so we're people of faith. We, and and uh, you know, we believe in America. Where I am, I'm the only judge in the Fourth Circuit home, Richmond. And that building I'm in was built in 1858 and it was the, the treasury of the Confederacy. And Davis had an office in that building. And I look out the window on the backside, just trying you know what I'm talking about, Bank Street, and you see the Capitol that was designed by Thomas Jefferson. And you see these two buildings speak to each other across time. And I think that's what sort of anchors me in the sense that, that, that what, what, what Dr. King talked about, the moral arc of the universe. Yeah. It bends toward justice. 
I mean, so those are the kind of things that, that tethered me. And one thing I just say about the court, the first time I went into the, came, went into the building I'm in now was in 1980 or so, I was working at a big firm and they had the lawyers come down and do uh, trial work to get experience. So I was caught upon it to represent present this woman from the South, a white woman. I didn't know her, she didn't know me. So I went down there and I figured out who she was and I walked up and introduced myself. I said, I'm your lawyer. Her spirit dropped from her eyes to her feet precipitously. It's like, oh my goodness, the lawyer they appointed me, I mean, just lock me up now, just go ahead, we don't need a trial. <laughs> you know, but the point was, I had an assignment. And that's what my parents taught me. You have an assignment and it cannot be changed because other people don't see who you are and understand what you bring to the table. That's what anchors me. Long story short, she, we had a great experience. She wrote me a wonderful letter. But now I think about it in that same lobby, my name is on the roster as the chief, chief judge of the court. But that's because people never gave up and fought hard. And that's Judge Fogel, yeah, thank, what keeps me anchored in, in, in that sense. As with some of my colleagues here, uh, for the period I lived in Birmingham, uh, I attended uh, uh, from first through sixth grade and, and uh, all black elementary school. We had hand-me-down books. They were, as I think uh, maybe Judge Stewart said, uh, tattered and torn, and many people had used them before we had, but our teachers were committed and absolutely dedicated, all black teachers, and they, uh, 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 were uh, disciplined in terms of uh, instruction and very much committed to their students learning what we needed to learn. So I feel as though I got a great education uh, at Wilkerson Elementary School in, in Birmingham and this may be true for a lot of us. Uh, if you got in trouble at school, you get in trouble at home because the teacher would call the house, so you get in, 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 in trouble uh, twice. The teachers were that kind of committed to uh, our success. Unlike uh, in my colleagues, I, uh, my parents moved to New Haven, Connecticut when I was just before high school, uh, and I attended predominantly white schools from that point forward and went off to a predominantly white university, Tufts University in 1968 outside of Boston. You may recall that was a year that uh, Dr. King and, and Robert Kennedy were assassinated at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago and all the, the violence. So uh, our society in general was in turmoil with the riots, uh, the demonstrations on campuses. Uh, I think up until 1966, 67, campuses have been relatively uh, calm uh, places uh, as much as they can be with you know, 18 to 22 year olds. When I arrived at Tufts University in 1968, uh, there were I think about 10 black students there and my class had 49. And it was a very challenging uh, time for the university to absorb that many black students, many of whom came from very um, uh, economically depressed backgrounds, very bright uh, students. And uh, in, in the midst of what had been uh, a much more homogenous environment, uh, Judge uh, Eric Washington, who's here, followed me a couple years later. And we were just saying last night that uh, in some ways we, we feel that we helped teach the university as much as they, they taught us. But I learned a lot there about resilience because uh, I think probably if I'd attended a black historically black university as my parents did and as they wanted me to do initially it may have been a little bit more of a nurturing environment uh, but we had to be resilient those 49 of us who arrived at at the Tufts campus in September of 1968. You know we've heard about your life challenges and I think that really says a lot about who each of you is and has become as a person but in your in your current role or in your legal career if you want to be a little bit broader. What has been the biggest professional challenge you've faced? What has been the hardest thing you've had to deal with? What I'm struggling with now is the fact that uh, Louisiana is number one in the nation in terms of the rates of incarceration. We have the Pew Trust involved in the state now assisting us with this. And I've reached out to William Hubbard and uh, other folk to talk about incarceration. In fact, 
when Hubbard was president of the ABA, he came down to uh, Louisiana to work with us and tell us what they'd been doing in South Carolina. But we incarcerate more people than China, Iran, and a hundred other nations that we think are, in, are worse than we are. Uh, the U.S., the United States incarcerates more people than anybody else, and Louisiana's number one in the nation. Now, what, to be a Chief Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court and have a statistic like that, that's nothing to be uh, proud of. And so that's, that's, a, that's more of a burden to me than anything else. And so one of, if you ask me what my challenge is, my challenge is between now uh, and, and 2020, when I leave uh, the court, uh, I said to Secretary LeBlanc, who's Secretary of Corrections, Department of Corrections, I'd like to be number two or number <laughs> three. I don't want to be number one in the nation. And, and, and it's a burden uh, to be a part of a, the judicial system this long, and you talk with young black men, uh, you know, and they talk about the disparities and the injustices, and, and, and I'm a part of it. Yeah. Uh, we, we uh, if you look at, uh, just look at the uh, statistics from uh, uh, our website, Department of Corrections, it's all there. Uh, mostly African-American men, and we've locked them up uh, long term, sometimes with uh, multiple billing them uh, with uh, small amounts of drugs, a few marijuana cigarettes for persons, and sometimes you, you know, they sh you stop them, sh uh, shake them down, they've got a, they riding a bicycle, or they, a couple of them standing on the corner. They got a marijuana cigarette. So, um, I, I guess uh, that is my challenge. I, I, I feel my commitment has always been about fundamental fairness, and uh, I want to leave a system that's a little bit improved in terms yeah. of that fairness yeah. issue. Being chief judge is a big deal to a lot of people. And until you're the chief judge, you don't really realize all that goes with it. And I think the three of us who are chief know, I sit the same number of times as all my colleagues, seven times a year, so I still hear cases, et cetera, yet at least 75% of my time is dealing with non-case related matters. And so I have a huge circuit. Texas is a big customer. Uh, I have nine judicial districts, which means I have nine chief district judges. I have 105 courthouses, 3,218 total support people in it. It's a huge operation, very geographic and dispersed. And once you become chief judge, you realize not only how expansive it is, but all the issues that bubble up to the chief judge to deal with. And so managing the time element in terms of dealing with all that, as well as the relationships and so forth on my own court, the 17 judges on my court, but it's more the chief judge, a lot of what we do deals not with the Fifth Circuit, but it's with the presiding over the Judicial Council. It's being a participant in the Judicial Conference of the United States. It's serving on committees. It's going out into the circuit. It's going to the border. It's dealing with you know issues that the district courts have. And so there's so many things that bubble up. It's a 24-7 constancy that when you're a regular circuit judge, you don't see that. You, you just don't. You deal with your cases. But once you become chief, it's, it, it's, it's there big time. So even being here, uh, I doubt the three of us while here, we've been sitting back there managing. You know, we've been listening to what's been going on, but we have literally been, you know, I've been on the phone with the circuit executive this morning, Roger and I are talking. So it's a full tilt. And it's, so it's a challenge to manage the expectations, deal with the various constituencies that are involved in terms of the district judges, yet at the same time, you have a huge collection of extremely smart, <laughs> taught ego Choose your words colleagues. Carefully. I am. <laughs> but you, you, when you get rooms full yeah. of very, very smart people, finished number one in their class, never been wrong once in their life, no. <laughs> uh, and when you've got to manage the discussions, the egos, but yet try to keep the relationships and try to do it as even-handedly as you can, that 
is a challenge on an ongoing basis. Being chief is probably my, my biggest professional challenge. I mean, it was, uh, it was tough uh, becoming a partner in a, in a law firm that had never had a black partner before. Uh, there was a lot of pressure, I felt, you know, on me to succeed. I didn't want to fail. There were black associates in the firm who were coming up through the ranks, and the firm had always been eminently fair to me and said, you know, if you earn the privilege of becoming a partner, you will, but it will be irrespective of race. And um, that's how I viewed it. I took them um, at their word, and, and, and they were uh, true to their word. And um, became a partner there and, and enjoyed it. But that was, a, that was a challenge back in the early 1980s. Well, I think the best part of the job we have as a federal judge are the law clerks that we employ. I think I've had 74 law clerks, who knows how many interns. But I try to mentor them and impress upon them because I believe there's only so much me or Roger Burnett or Guy can do. But our obligation is to plant some seeds in those law clerks and young lawyers because they need to be the ambassadors for the importance of the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, solving a lot of these intractable problems that we can't do. So while being chief judge has its potholes, it is a position of tremendous opportunity to do good. But in the end, it's not the victories, it's the struggle that binds us. And I, and I think that's, that struggle is one that we all do, whether by necessity or the ethics uh, whatever it might be, or gender, whatever it might be, as Americans we struggle, but hopefully this ideal that we still tether mm -hmm. ourselves to mm -hmm. it. So I think the union uh, uh, is hopeful. And Judge Folker, you know where the hope came the most for me, and I'll say this, in terms of having a glimpse of something, a light, that no darkness could obscure. And that was when I was 10 years old, I just very fast forward. And I'm not going to tell you how it happened, but just remember that it was stupidity on steroids. But I, I hurt, I injured my eye when I was at home alone. My mom came and she said, what's wrong with you, boy? I tried to hide it from her and, and I was tearing, but it really, it really wasn't tears. But anyway, the long story short, finally she takes me to the hospital, the ER. They look at my eye and they're about to uh, release me and say, he's fine, go home. But it just so happened that a young white ophthalmologist was coming through. And I don't know whether he had just finished a long shift of 16 hours, whatever, but he said, let me see that boy's eye. And he looked at me, he said, his eyeball is cracked, he'll be blind and I, if he doesn't have surgery soon. And he said, and the nurse looked at him and she said, there's no room for him. And he looked at her and said, listen, this boy's going into surgery at midnight and you better have a place for him. And the next morning, I woke up, my mom and dad at my bedside, and there were seven other empty beds in that big room. Mm -hmm. They had run out of room on the side designated for me. That's what gives me hope. That young white ophthalmologist at 10 years old gave me the glance of a light that no darkness can obscure. And even though we have a long ways to go and many miles before we sleep, as Frost might say, I think we have the framework, even though our framers, our founders didn't live it, but they gave a matrix with which we might live through that. And I believe that we're gonna be okay, but that's gonna be some difficult days ahead. But I think, uh, I, I have a lot of hope that we Thank will. Thank you. Yes.